Thank you for joining once again and welcome to today's uh, program hosted by the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust in New York. We are here to discuss Martin Puchner's new book, The Language of Thieves, My Family's Obs Obsession with a Secret Code the Nazis Tried to Eliminate, just released three weeks ago. It's a fascinating tale about Jews and gypsies and Nazis and language, and we highly recommend that you purchase the book so that you can read it in full. But today we will dive into it as much as we can within the hour with our two guests. Let me introduce them before we begin. The author is Martin Puchner, the Byron and Anita Wien Professor of English and Comparative Literature at Harvard University. Martin is a prize-winning author, educator, public speaker, and institution builder in the arts and humanities. And his writings, which include a dozen books and anthologies and over 60 articles and essays, range from philosophy and theater to world literature and have been translated into many languages. Although not, I suspect, the language that we are discussing today. Uh, in conversation with Martin is Marina Balotnikova, a journalist who covers interesting ideas, people, and culture. She writes and edits stories for Harvard Magazine, and before that, she wrote for the editorial boards of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette and the Toledo Blade, and edited the opinion page of the Harvard Crimson. While Martin and Marina are speaking, if you in the audience have any questions or comments, please feel free to put them in the Zoom Q&A feature and we'll address them during a Q&A period towards the end of the program. Martin and Marina, welcome. We're really glad to have you here. Great to be here, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for the introduction, Ari. I'm so glad and, and grateful to be here and to be talking about this important um, and unique memoir. Um, thank you to the Museum of Jewish Heritage for having us. Um, this is certainly an eventful and distracting week um, in which to be having this conversation. So I, I really appreciate everyone being here despite that. Um, but Martin's book is, is not actually all that remote from, from what's happening in, in the world today, as we'll talk about a little later. Um, so Martin, to, to get us started. Well, before um, you, Marina, let me just, I, well put, and I just want to share that two minute trailer. Um, it's a little video clip, uh, which I think will sort of set the stage for the conversation and for those of you who have not read the book. So I'll put that up on the screen and then tune out and uh, leave it up to you too. Just a moment. Have you ever been in a pickle or come across signs left by hobos during the Great Depression warning one another about aggressive dogs and policemen? Then you have encountered an ancient language of the road spoken by vagrants and refugees, merchants and thieves since the European Middle Ages. Scholar Martin Puchner was inducted into this secret code by his uncle, what began as a youthful infatuation suddenly turned dark during his studies at Harvard University. I was sitting in Widener Library, procrastinating, when I thought, why not look up my grandfather, a historian of names, see whether the library has any of his stuff. I went to the card catalog, which led me deep into the stacks of the library. And that's where I discovered it a terrible anti-Semitic tract about Jewish names written by my grandfather. I was completely shocked and also puzzled because the article attacked a secret language called Rotwelsch that I had learned to love as a child, a language my father and my uncle had been strangely obsessed with their entire lives. The discovery brought him face to face with family secrets the Nazi campaign against foreign words, and ultimately to today's America, interweaving family memoir with scholarship and an adventurous foray into the politics of language, Puchner finds in the mysterious language of Thebes a spirit of tolerance, resourcefulness, and wit that remains essential today. That was wonderful. I hadn't actually seen that trailer yet, but that was incredibly well done. Um, so Martin, to get us started, um, for audiences who aren't yet familiar with your book, could you tell us um, the origin story of the language of thieves and what, um, you know, recap, what, what did you want to get across in it? 
Sure. And, you know, let me just start, uh, Marina, by, by thanking you for reading the book and writing such a nice review, thought, searching review of it, and Ari for hosting this event. As, as you can imagine, when I wrote the book, I was hoping that it would lead to conversations such as this hosted by this institution. So this is particularly uh, meaningful to me. So yeah, uh, uh, um, Marina, that there, there, since the book in a way interweaves these two stories, the story of the language and the story of my family, they're, they're really sort of two origins. Uh, 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 as far as the language is concerned, uh, the origin is really in my childhood because I, as, as mentioned in the trailer, I, I grew up around this secret thieves language uh, uh, that combines German, Yiddish, and through Yiddish Hebrew and some other uh, uh, languages. And so this was sort of a childhood, uh, very playful uh, fascination of mine. And then uh, later I inherited this unique archive on this language uh, put together by my uncle. And so, and I always felt that, that uh, I needed to do something with this, that that was sort of a forgotten language and that I had in my possession this unique resource to, to write about it. So, so, so that was sort of the origin uh, of, of the story of the language. Um, but then as, as, as is also mentioned in the trailer, there, there's the other story, the, the family history. Uh, um, and that really started with this moment featured in the trailer in Harvard, uh, you know, in Widener Library at Harvard, where, where I discovered this, this track uh, and realized that, that there was this dark past uh, uh, my grandfather's that I knew nothing about. Uh, and so I started to research that, research his history. Um, and in the course of that, trying to understand how my family now for with me, including me, the, for three generations has been so strangely entangled with this, with this language. So those are the two origins uh, of the two stories that, that are connected for me and in, interwoven in the book. Mm -hmm. How did you, I'm curious, how did you start to realize that you, you wanted to connect your discoveries with, about your family with your you know, scholarly work and, and make it into a subject of your, of your research? Were those like two different worlds for you that you, you realized that you know, actually they can come together? Yeah, um, you know, if I, if, I, if I look at this book, which as I said, is this family history, it's the history of this language, but there are, I think you're absolutely right, there are resonances with my other scholarly work. It's a book about how things are written down. It's about archives uh, uh, because my grandfather was an archivist. You know, he made this wonderful career in post-war Germany, uh, becoming head of the state archive. So it's, it's very much a, a book also about what gets written down and what does not get written down. The language itself is mostly a purely spoken language. Uh, um, it's, there's also uh, the connection to literature. I'm a scholar of literature, primarily language and literature. And uh, one reason my uncle was so captivated by this, by this language was that, that he felt like it was an incredible literary resource and he was not alone. Others like Franz Kafka came across it because they felt like it was this playful, unusual language that, that, that had uh, incredible potential for literature. And so he himself uh, translated bits of world literature into this language, including Shakespeare, including parts of the Hebrew Bible, uh, many other little texts to sort of to showcase it. So there was a kind of literary project here as well. A and he uh, studied very closely, and I reconstruct that in the book, uh, since Yiddish is so important uh, as a source for this language, he very carefully studied the way in which Yiddish moved from a mostly spoken language to a literary language through different translation projects. Um, and so, yeah, so there, there are definitely a lot of uh, 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 scholarly themes that 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 have shaped my interests but the 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 driver in many ways was this unusual language which is in many ways unlike anything i had studied before and this family history and and for the for the longest time i felt like i was going to write about a book about Rook Welsh, this 
this language and and the kind of hidden world because i felt like this language was would give you sort of a window into this otherwise completely mysterious and inaccessible uh, world of the itinerant underground of central europe really from the middle ages to the to the 20th century but then i realized that as i was also researching my grandfather's history and and confronting that history um, that that i needed to address the fact that this wasn't just uh, another scholarly book or another scholarly interest that it had very deeply to do with the with my family and the this this family secret that 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 i had to discover and and that had resonances i felt like with post war germany and 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 the way in which uh, the third reich is or is not being addressed and uh, and so it became a much more personal uh, uh, story. I had never written a memoir or family history. I never thought I would. And I was sort of, in some sense, I, 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 I was step by step, I realized that that needed to be part of the book as well. And so this was new territory for me and, 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 and difficult in many ways, but uh, it felt like the, the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. So you you made this discovery um, of your grandfather's dissertation while you were a grad student at Harvard. Um, could you tell like you know tell us the story of of what you found there and how you um, you know what what did you feel ab about it how um, how did you how did you process that um, and you know and then react to it in, in the wake of your discovery? Yeah. So the the the, the, the this article that was part of a scholarly work is. Um, what I had known about him was what the, that he was a historian of names, which always, as a child, seemed like an extremely obscure specialization. An archivist, a very dry scholarly, super specialized sort of work on on the place names of certain regions in Bavaria in the you know in in the 12th century or something like that. Those would be the the, the sort of typical work of his, um, and almost comical. In, in its obscurity. Uh, but then in this article, he clearly tries to, from, from 1934, he tries to make his super obscure specialty, he basically puts it in the service of the Nazi uh, regime that has just started. Uh, and the way what he's, he writes is about, the, the article is called uh, 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 with family names as, as racial signifiers or as racial markers. And what he offers uh, to the Nazis essentially is to say, okay, I, you're, you've been trying to distinguish Germans from Jews, right? That there is this whole, the, 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 the biological race thinking uh, where you know doctors tried to measure noses and skulls and all, all of that, but clearly that never went, I mean, that was cracked crackpot science. So he was saying, I have another way of doing this. Uh, I can do it with the history of names and to distinguish German sounding Jewish names and Jewish sounding German names. And then we can create a, 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 a registry of Jewish names. And then we have to outlaw, you know, Jews are no longer allowed to change their names and, and, and all these things. So that, that was, that was the, the article. And it was, it was an attempt to, on his part, to put this, this historical knowledge and expertise in, in, in the service of, of, the, of the Nazi regime. Mm -hmm. And that was, um, this was a surprise to you. It, uh, right? it came, absolutely, it was a, a, a complete surprise, um, though then the story became uh, more complicated. It was a complete shock. Uh, I was shocked. I knew that he, you know, as the phrase, well, you know, had been in the war, that it had been a, you know, member of the, uh, of the armed forces, but that's basically what what I knew about about his past. Uh, looking back, of course, I'm shocked that I never uh, that I never asked really explicitly what did he do during the Third Reich. It's just, and that's it was very typical in in some ways, even though. Uh, uh, you know, in many ways, in, in my generation, I was, I was born in, 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 in 69, uh, when we went to high school uh, uh, in, in the 80s, there was a very robust uh, teaching of the Holocaust uh, by that time, not really before, but by my time. So my generation was, in a sense, I think the first generation of Germans that had a very detailed uh, and more or less unvarnished uh, uh, knowledge of, of the Holocaust. But it was somehow a very, 
abstract historical, this has happened, you know, in black and white photographs, it seemed far away, far in the past. And somehow I hadn't made the connection to the family that there's something personal, that is something that could connect my family to it. And, and it seems really so surprising in retrospect, but that's, that's, how, it, that's how it was. So um, it made me, um, you know, realize that this whole teaching of history as a sort of an abstract thing that happens in the past is not enough that, that you have to think about how people's families transport this knowledge. And so the first thing I did was I confronted my father with, uh, with, with this um, and um, he didn't know about this article, but he did say that in, 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 in the sixties that he had come across a family photograph that he was developing for a, a Christmas calendar uh, uh, of his grandfather, mother, and oldest brother uh, from uh, 37. And as he was magnifying the photo, the negative, developing it, he saw that his grandfather is wearing a swastika. And that for him was, so he confronted his, his, his father uh, about it. And so there was a bit of a brouhaha, but then, uh, and I don't know exactly what was being said, but then, so my father knew that there was something uh, that uh, dark in his father's past, but then that moment of reckoning, that confrontation in, that happened in the 60s, somehow was allowed to fall, drop into the background again. And, and I, I, nothing was ever said to me. And then in a way I had to, make this discovery in, in Weiner in the 90s all, all over again. So th this is how the book became not just a book about a secret language, but also a book about how this family secret in a way got passed down from one generation to the next. Um, so you, you write in the book, and I'm going to quote a bit here because the, the, this part of the book really stuck for me, and I think it, it might for audience members as well. Um, you wrote, whenever I told people that I had grown up in Nuremberg, there was a quick pause followed by an O. Oh. Uh, I could imagine the images that were fl flashing through my interlocutors' minds, images of rallies and of Nazi flags. Somehow I had been born into the epicenter of Nazism. It was part of the patina of shame that colored my life abroad. Um, that passage was so powerful for me because I hadn't thought of that so explicitly in those terms that you put it before, but you're absolutely right. That is what I think of when I think of Nuremberg, you know, it's, it's synonymous with, with crimes against humanity. Um, and so I'm curious, how, how do you think that's shaped the way you, you go through the world and your experience in the United States? Yeah, and so the the I, I mean the it, it's the last part the United States that's crucial here because you know if you grow up in a place you you sort of take it for granted that's where you have your own childhood memories and so on and so forth it sort of def defines normalcy for you, but then uh, and so this was certainly the case as I was growing up uh, with, with Nuremberg it was just my hometown and 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 you know period. But then as I, through school and, and others, started to learn about the Holocaust, you realize, oh, there's so this thing that's connected to my hometown. And of course, they were the, the rally grounds that were, that they were, you know, they were not in the center, but just, you know, still part of the city. And, and they were sort of half abandoned. And I, I would, we would sometimes go there. We would sometimes take visitors there. And so, you know, they would become sort of part of the city tour in so this kind of odd way. Uh, um, but so you start to think, oh, there's this something else going on in this town that, that, that doesn't accord with my childhood memory. But then the crucial step for me was moving abroad, leaving Nuremberg, leaving Germany. Uh, first, I lived for a year in Italy, but then in the United States. And then, of course, as you know, it always happens, you look at yourself sort of from this new vantage point. Uh, and, and, and I think that's when fully this, what I describe in this paragraph and what you quoted, uh, you begin to see, oh, I, now I understand people looking at my home town that, that for me has a certain set of images and association in a completely different way. And that, that became part of my view of the city itself. And, and I think that whole uh, uh, complex of things, I think is also speaks to I've been thinking a lot about this 
the book as a whole, because I, I don't think I would have, you know, even though I, I, you know, when I inherited this, this archive, I thought, oh, I want to write a, a book about the secret language, but it's now become clear to me that if I hadn't moved to the United States and removed myself, if you will, from Germany and, and this set of associations and look back at it from a distance, I don't think I would have written this, this book. So um, yeah, the sort of removing yourself and, and looking at yourself and your hometown and, and, and your country's past through other eyes is, is a very important uh, part of the book, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, let's talk a bit more about um, Rottwelsh, the Rottwelsh language and its, its history. Um, where did where did this language come from? Who who spoke it? Um, you know, how did its community of speakers evolve? Yeah. So it you know it 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 starts in the Middle Ages, um, but everything about it is is very hard to pin down, uh, and the main reason for that is that it was is a purely spoken language. Uh, although there were also these written signs that are mentioned briefly in the trailer, these kind of hobo signs, uh, 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 you know, go here for bread and, 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 and so on and so avoid this town because it has an aggressive policeman, these kind of carved runes almost. But th the language itself was, was purely spoken. And so there is a written record, uh, but the written record in, in many ways is, is, is one assembled by the enemies of this language, uh, uh, ideological enemies like Martin Luther. He's one of the first to write a book about this language to warn people against its speakers. Um, and then police records, uh, because the police felt like, oh, this was this kind of criminal language. Uh, uh, so we, we need to write it down. So there, there is a record, a written record, but it is essentially a police record, a hostile record. So you have to sort of, what I started to realize is that you have to read this record against the grain in many ways. But so what you can uh, reconstruct is that it was a language, even though it was very heavily influenced by Yiddish and, and Hebrew, though also by some other languages, uh, the grammar is essentially German, um, that it was a language of the road. Uh, it was not a language that was ethnically identified, unlike Yiddish or Romani, the language of the Sinti Roma, formerly known as Gypsies. Uh, the, 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 although both of these languages, Yiddish and Romani, had an influence on this language, but it was sort of influenced by a milieu. If you drift, if you left settled society behind, behind for whatever reason, if you were an itinerant peddler, if you were a runaway soldier, if you just uh, 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 sort of drifted into this life of the underground, you would be inducted into it uh, uh, and become, become a speaker. So most people would sort of code switch be between whatever local dialect they grew up with and this sort of language of a milieu, the secret the secret language. And so it was spoken in, in Central Europe, es essentially in German speaking Central Europe, though sort of from the Rhine, though also extending to Prague. Uh, uh, so that, that I would say sort of the geographic uh, uh, area. So um, a language of the road uh, that, that, uh, um, that was spoken by itinerants of, of, all, of all kinds. So to call it language of thief, thieves as I do in the book as what it's usually known is 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 actually a, a, a in some sense a pejorative one uh, because it's what the written record calls it the written record as I said that's often been hostile to it so the two names for the language I think speak to it quite well the 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 main name for it is rot Welsh rot uh, uh, um, in this language means beggar. Uh, Welsh uh, actually has nothing to do with Wales. Uh, it means incomprehensible. So rot Welsh, the incomprehensible cant of beggars or beggars cant or beggars argo, you could call it. The other name is derived uh, uh, from, from Hebrew uh, is kashamer lashen. So kacham to, to wise or to know. Uh, Lashan language uh, or tongue or, or language. So uh, I would translate that as the language of those in the know, the language of the wise guys in, in that sort of mob inflection uh, uh, that's also common in, in America. Yeah. 
Um, and why did why why did Rob Welsh have this imagined connection to um, to Jewish people? Why why, why would the idea that that Jews and and, and vagrants and I you know itinerant people are are one and the same have made sense to people like Martin Luther and and your grandfather? Yeah, so that's it, it. It that was one of the most complicated things for me to figure out because on the one hand, right, you have people like Martin Luther, my grandfather, or others, hostiles, who, for whom this language becomes sort of a perfect instance of, of a kind of anti-Semitic uh, uh, imagination, because it seems to connect Jewishness, because there is a lot of Hebrew in the language uh, through Yiddish, and criminality, because it's seen, even though it's actually sort of a language of a milieu, is seen as a criminal language or language of the criminal underground. So if you have an anti-Semitic mindset, in some ways, it's a kind of perfect, it's a perfect example. It's in a sense what, what, what we anti-Semites have been saying all along. There's a connection between Jewishness and criminality. Uh, and this is, you know, for example, what my grandfather's article, that was a shock that he write, he wrote this about, wrote Welsh in, in this article. Uh, um, so, so, uh, so obviously that, that uh, uh, everything in that idea about Ruth Welsh is, is mostly wrong. Uh, though there is of course, from a, from a sort of linguistic perspective, there is a connection because there is a lot of uh, Yiddish in it. And so it's very hard to know exactly why. Um, I think there, there is, of course, a sense in which Yiddish, though in a very different way, is a kind of migratory language or a language of migration uh, that, that may have been available in, in, you know, in the Middle Ages and early modern period uh, uh, for, uh, for itinerants to hear and absorb. Um, there, there, of course, there are some Jewish peddlers and Jewish vagrants, and they're certain along at certain periods, for example, in the aftermath of the Thirty Years' War, th there are gangs that are sort of identified as Jewish gangs uh, where this language is spoken. So it's not that that no Jews ever spoke it, but the the the, the most speakers were in most uh, case histories I was able to reconstruct were were Christian. I mean, or the proportion of Jewishness and Jewish and Christian speakers was sort of proportional to the population. Uh, so as I said, it was in that sense, not uh, uh, religiously or ethnically identified. Uh, but so there, so there is a linguistic connection. Uh, um, and, um, uh, but, but, but that's it. And so it's very important to separate that, I found very important, from the kind of uh, uh, written record that suggested this, you know, uh, in a kind of anti-Semitic vein, this this connection of criminal and Jewishness, yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's there's also this idea that um, you know the Rod Welsh speakers are dangerous because they, you know, they can't be contained by borders, which is you know has a, a you know, connect, connected to the um, you know a, a similar anti anti-Semitic idea that Jews are um, you know that Jews aren't of this nation or um, you know rootless. That exactly. I, I think no. I think that's a very important point. Uh, um, and and also to so I think that in in both cases there is such a that's became a, a really sort of important puzzle or something to think through this this connection between language and ethnicity. Let's let's say because both play a role. Both are heavily used in a sort of anti-Semitic campaign against both Ruth Welsh speakers and Jewish people. Um, and both though in, in a completely different way are connected through, through, through this language. There is of course also, I think another reason why, they, they, why they, it's, it's such a complicated tangle of ideas and historical forces is that for many, uh, Yiddish itself, from a kind of German Christian perspective, was sometimes seen as a secret language, and that you know the term Mauschon was used for speaking Yiddish, but it also meant speaking in a way that's incomprehensible to a German speaker. So there, there's already this idea that that Yiddish is sort of a, 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 a not just uncouth, but also there's something dangerous about it, and that there were dictionaries for Christians. Uh, so that they could 
teach themselves some Yiddish so that they could understand what's going on in the marketplace or wherever. And, and that in a sense is similar to the way in which people wanted to understand rote Welsh so that they could understand what's going on. So there's this, this fear of a group that speaks differently, that, that, that uh, violates borders, as you say, uh, uh, and so on and so forth, yeah. Um, and you, so you were exposed to, to Rod Welsh as a, as a child, right? It sounds like, you know, before you had any awareness of its, you know, that it had such a um, maligned history. Um, can you tell us a bit about that and, and what made you, um, what made you captivated by the language when you were young? Yeah, I mean, that was, you know, it looks also it's so innocent now, a childhood idol. Uh, but when I grew up, when I was young, uh, uh, I, I, I grew up around it because of this uncle who was uh, 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 obsessed with it, um, who really devoted his life to, to this language. And he would teach me, and it was this kind of fun thing uh, where it's like you could play around with language. Uh, uh, and I, I loved the kind of certain expressions. Uh, uh, and, and what I loved, what I learned from my uncle is that some of these expressions had sort of filtered into German. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and so people were speaking, using root Welsh idioms without realizing it. And one of them is being in a pickle, by the way, which is which even made it into into English. So uh, everyone who's ever used that term, that phrase, being in a pickle, has been speaking rote Welsh with, without realizing it. And the way it happens is that there is there is a a, a, um, a rote Welsh phrase, Yiddish rote Welsh phrase uh, being, you know, for for uh, 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 that, that that sounded to German speakers, like saure Gurkenzeit, the time of pickles, whereas actually it meant the time of suffering and hardship, uh, but was then simply by the sound transfer assimilated into German, uh, and then from there into English as being in a pickle, which, which makes no sense. It's unclear why being in a pickle or pickle why that's a bad thing you know it's a it's a good food uh, but anyway so 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 that that's that's what i loved as a child this idea that 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 our family had this sort of special knowledge of this language and that 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 you, i could i could claim to friends and uh, 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 that they're that they didn't realize that they're speaking this thief's language uh, using these phrases so that was sort of the fun uh, uh, part of it um, um, but then, uh, you know, since then, but after this discovery and after I just, about my grandfather and after I inherited this, this archive, uh, um, it became part that only then did I sort of, because even though I'd grown up around this language, I knew, as you say, uh, Marina, I knew nothing about its history. It was just this fun thing. Uh, and then I, uh, I just, I slowly, uh, you know, researched this whole history that we, that we've been talking about uh, much later and trying at the same time trying to understand how come that my uncle devoted his life to this language um, to this very language that his father had tried to eliminate uh, and it's unclear uh, because uh, uh, you know it's, it's unclear whether whether he knew that um, what he knew but it it, 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 without a doubt, there was some sense in which his whole, because he certainly knew that Rote Welsh speakers were among the first to be sent to concentration camps, that there was this anti-Semitic history connected to it. And so it was very clear that in many ways, it, that was his personal project undertaken in the 60s and 70s and into the early 80s when he died unexpectedly, a very early, very young in his 40s, um, that that was part of a kind of redemption or a, 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 a a uh, his way of working through uh, Germany's post-war period. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and of course that was a that was a time in, in German history. <clears throat> like you, you talked about earlier, when when the history of the Holocaust was really coming into um, the consciousness. Um, 
So that's interesting context too. Um, I don't think many people know that that Rockwell speakers were one of the groups that were targeted by they were targeted by authorities throughout European history, but but that they were targeted by the Nazis. Um, what what happened to the Rockwell community during World War II? Yeah, so absolutely, there were there 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 is an interesting figure. So part of what I did, I tried to sort of reconstruct these these figures in Ruth Welsh history. And, and some of them are sort of these 17th, 18th century sort of Robin Hood-like figures who become sort of famous thieves and, 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 and rob the rich and give to the poor kind of figures. But there's one figure, uh, Gregor Gog, who, who is an, an interesting to me because he in the 20s tried to organize uh, vagrants and, and in a sense turn them into a community. Um, um, and as he, this is why he was sort of known uh, uh, half jokingly, half seriously as the king of the tramps. And his uh, story is exemplifies what, what, what you're talking about, Marina, because he, um, so he tried to organize these meetings of tramps uh, and to, to start a, a newspaper uh, that's in a sense sort of a, an early version of today's sort of homeless papers uh, that get passed out on, in, in Harvard Square. Uh, uh, and other places, um, so to, to create a kind of cohesion uh, uh, and and to create uh, uh, to to ask for better conditions and so on and so forth. But so he was targeted. He's one of the people who was targeted, and he was was sent to con concentration camps very very early on uh, uh, to one of the first concentration camps. Uh, they were still more improvised, so he actually managed to escape uh, and then escape to the Soviet Union. But, but uh, uh, yes, they were uh, uh, targeted. They were seen as asocial. Uh, they, they were given a, a brown star. Uh, uh, and uh, as asocial, you know, criminal, I mean, this, that whole repertoire of, of prejudices, it was connected to Jewishness uh, uh, in, in the anti-Semitic uh, uh, imagination. Uh, uh, in a negative way, and so yeah, so they were they were rounded up and sent to concentration camps. Um, and Gregor Rock, the king of the Thames, uh, uh, above all. Mm -hmm. um, I want to make sure I ask a couple questions, kind of closer to the the present um, before we get to the the Q and A. Um, and I, so I'm curious how you would you know. Ref reflect on the degree of success in Germany of repudiating Nazi ideology and, and building um, a national identity that isn't based on, as, as you put it in the book, but I think you were quoting former President George Bush, um, a national identity that's not based on blood, birth, and soil. Um, and I, I ask that because it, I, I think the consensus in America for a long time was that Germany had done so well at reckoning, reckoning with its past um, you know, better in some ways that than the United States had had reckoned with its past. Um, but more recently, I've we've started to see signs that that maybe that's not so stable with the you know the disturbing rise of the German far right and and reports. Um, yeah, these have you know, have swelled the ranks of the German military and police, for example. Yeah. No. Absolutely. I mean, I I you know I thought a lot about this. Uh, we, that's how we started the conversation in some ways about this, you know, the, 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 the German reckoning with the past, Vergangenheitsbewältigung, as it's called. And I, I do think that in some ways it, it is quite, was quite thorough. Uh, uh, and and, and uh, once it started very belatedly uh, in, in the 70s and 80s, the immediate post-war period, a couple of decades, no one wanted to talk about the past. Uh, uh, which is why my uh, grandfather could have his career. Um, but so, I, I, and I do think that as we are reckoning with the history of the United States and the legacy of slavery and so on and so forth, there, there are certainly some things to be learned there. Uh, I, I wouldn't deny that. But, you know, what, what this, what the, per, the family story and my experience with it, I think also taught me the limits of this. German reckoning with the past, uh, and I would say at least two uh, uh, two, two limits. Um, the the first is that it happened almost without connection to any Jewish people, uh, uh, so it was this strange sort of German internal reckoning with its own past, uh, but but in a, in a in a almost kind of an isolation. Um, 
And the second was that it, that it was, as I said, it was sort of capital H history. It was not personal history. It was not family history. And, and that was a real oversight, I think, that, that um, and, you know, it's much harder when it is personal, when it's connected to your family and, and your sense of self. And, uh, you know, I'll say that uh, 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 members of my family have not been universally delighted with, with this book either. So it's so, uh, I, I do think that there's something there was something earnest and, and good and important uh, that, that happened in, in, in Germany in the 70s and 80s around it. But, and, but now, as you say, it's also clear that it's far from a consensus. And what I find most disturbing about it is the way in which the, the kind of rise of neo-Nazis in Germany and and in the United States, the connection between them, you know, the way in which in Charlottesville, there, there are sort of German flags and Nazi flags. Whereas, and, and in Germany, I think for the first time you have neo-Nazis running out with Confederate flags. Uh, now, now, of course you could say that there are sort of long historical connections in, in that Nazi race thinking was actually influenced by uh, you know, American slavery and, and, and especially in the South, uh, the kind of race thinking developed in the American South. So you could say, yes, there was a connection, but the, what's happening now with these is almost a kind of international right wing uh, uh, alliance where, you know, you, 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 you have Confederate flags and Nazi flags uh, in all of these different parts of the world. And that, that's, that's frightening. Mm -hmm. And I think I think one of the things you show so well in the book is these ideas go go so deep and and so far back, you know, about people, um, you know, borderless people being being dangerous um, and kind of you know the the soup of ideas about criminality and and Jewishness and um, vagrancy that it's you know it's it, it, <laughs> you can't really erase it in one generation, right? I think I think that's right, um, and you know you 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 keep mentioning this question of borders and and mobile populations and and uh, and mobile words. I mean, this is where for me it's always it it, it this book aims at this place where biology and language are connected. Uh, sometimes connected, actually connected. Other people connect them and 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 I think that's um, um, uh, it's connected to it and so part of the history of the book is is therefore the a history of borders uh, and the history of the rise of the nation state um, mm -hmm. so you know the, 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 the requirement to wear to, to carry passports a lot of it has to do with the aftermath of the 30 years war the peace of Westphalia in a way which ordered the map of, created the map of modern Europe with its borders. And so where you then, you know, and where you have a, a, a much more comprehensive police regime that can arrest you and you have to show papers. Uh, and some of this, the Woodwell speakers are, are adept at forging passports. There's only one source, uh, 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 a written source by a word Welsh speaker is, is someone because he was able, he knew how to read and write really well in the 19th century, the police pick him up. Uh, he, he knows how to read and write well because his uh, uh, function in the ecosystem of the underground is, is forging passports, but that becomes more and more important uh, in, 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 the, in the 18th, late 17th, 18th and 19th centuries as, as the modern state, nation state rises and and this always then rubs against these mobile populations uh, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah I'm, I'm i'm glad you you brought that up because that was one of the the really interesting parts of the book to me and and kind and it kind of threaded the needle between um you know between all of these things um in in a really new way um we i can you know i can ask you questions forever but um we <laughs> we're, we're quickly running out of time um this has been really great martin it's a it's been a pleasure to to get to talk to you and i'm going to hand it over to ari for some questions from the audience thank you marina Hello again, everyone. Uh, thank you for all the questions and comments you've been submitting so far in the chat and Q&A. Please feel free to keep them coming. I do want to share some of them with, with uh, Martin and Marina here. 
Got one from an attendee named CRG, which uh, says, was it mainly men who spoke the language because they were sort of people on the road or did families speak it? And then separately, how extensive was the vocabulary of Broad Welsh? Mm, yeah, great question. So when I started, I, it seemed to me at first that it was mostly spoken by men because most of the sort of charismatic Robin Hood-like figures or the king of the tramps, uh, they were all men. Uh, but then I started to look further and I realized that that was actually not true. That there were, I found stories of women speaking it and especially in times of upheaval, uh, like in the aftermath of the 30 years war when, when there was a lot of internal migration and a lot of, uh, 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 when there were sort of large groups of people, 50 to 100 people who formed and roamed around, um, there, there were a lot of women and children and families who, who spoke it. Um, I mentioned that one written source uh, written, the only written form of word Welsh by, by a speaker, and he, the police force him to kind of, uh, uh, re, you know, reveal the language and write these, write scenes from the underground in word Welsh, and the, the scenes that he describes, uh, and this is one way where you can gauge the speakers, uh, are, are women and, and children also uh, traveling together, you know, sort of petty theft and peddlers and different kinds of vagrants. So it was definitely uh, spoken as much by women uh, as I would say, as, as, as by men. It was defined by a milieu. And if you drifted into the milieu, um, you, um, you were, would be sort of slowly inducted into it. That's so interesting. And uh, um, Stanley Weinstein asked a question, which I was wondering listening to you, which is, are there still speakers of Rod Welsh outside of academia? Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, sometimes I, I ask myself, wait, am I the last speaker of Ruth Walsh? But that, that, you know, that quickly became clear to me that that would be very silly and presumptuous, A, because I'm not really a full speaker. Uh, uh, I just sort of grew up around it. Uh, and, and B, uh, uh, yeah, primarily because of that. But so, yes. So um, it's, it's very, it's a little difficult to pin down the bound as with a, such a such a mobile object of study, the boundaries both geographically and historically. But I think so. There are definitely sort of new versions or or itinerant idioms that are still spoken that have a lot of root Welsh terms in them. And so I, I finished the book at the American Academy in Berlin, uh, uh, which is appropriately located on the Wannsee, in a villa on the Wannsee, which like you can basically see the house of the Wannsee conference uh, across the lake. So that was a place where I finished it. Um, um, in any case, while I was there, a journalist wrote an article about this project and uh, um, which was great because people started to write to me and saying, oh, I still have a connection or I still know someone. And so through indirectly through an intermediary, uh, I got in touch with, a group of itinerants in Switzerland hmm. and was able to ask them questions through this itinerary, uh, th through this uh, intermediary. And it became clear that they still speak a language that's partially derived from, from Rot Welsh. Uh, but it also became clear to me very much, they talked about how suspicious they are of people like me who are, have an interest in the language. And they, they even said that they, you know, when a, when a linguist or a researcher comes to them that they make stuff up, uh, that they don't want this language to be generally known. And so it, it you know, but, but so yes, so th that's how the book ends actually with, with this sort of indirect uh, uh, dialogue with, with some of these speakers. So it's not, uh, um, it's in some sense, it's, it's disappeared, but it's also popped back up and it's not entirely, it has not entirely disappeared. And it, it seems like perhaps the, uh, well, certainly the small number of people that speak it, although it hasn't disappeared, but, but also their, their reluctance to share it with uh, inquirers elsewhere, maybe is one of the reasons why it's, it's, it's not covered. I mean, when you Google Rotwells, there's very little that comes up except for you. Well, Right. <laughs> yes. No, it's true. And I think that's, that's, that's that sort of instinct of secrecy, distrust of the state and of anyone who wants to 
want something from you and, and their motives. And if you study this history, it's it's completely understandable. And now I remember you a part of your uh, question I, I didn't answer is how extensive the vocabulary list is. So I should say for those who are sort of linguists that it's linguists would not would call it a sociolect uh, because the grammar is mostly German grammar. So linguists define language as as, as a sort of a system of rules that that, that can generate infinite sentences. By that definition, it's not a, a, a full language, but a sociolect. But what it is basically, it's a large lexicon. It's a list of terms and, and many, many. I mean, there's a, my uncle created handwritten uh, 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 dictionaries and, and card expressions, card, part of his archive, uh, uh, hundreds and hundreds of expressions. And there is one dictionary that that's quite, you know, quite thick that has, uh, uh, you know, a few thousand entries. There are a couple of folks in the audience asking for you to speak a little bit more about Welsh. So there are a couple expressions that you think are particularly interesting. Yeah, I mean, so so some of my, uh, I, I already mentioned in a pickle, I, I, another expression I love is on Hasen machen, which means to make a rabbit, uh, which does not, is not a recipe for making a rabbit stew or anything like that. It means to make a quick escape. Um, and uh, um, so that that seems uh, 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 appropriate. Uh, you know, the, the it, it it may also be uh, uh, interesting that so another phrase uh, which made it to America is so in in the, the expression for going to prison is to go to shul. Uh, uh, and so this is if for those who uh, uh, re recently watched the Irishman. Uh, that, that's that's an expression that that comes up there too. To go to shul uh, is to go to prison. So that's uh, that that that's an idiom. And in fact, the, you know, the language really is a kind of mirror of a of 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 a whole life. So there are many many expressions for prison and for going for being arrested. Many many words for different kinds of police. Many ways of many words for you know life. On the road, and so it's 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 really if you look at the at, at the language, you you get a that's where you get sort of a window uh, into this language. And uh, as you know, the, the each chapter of the book ends with a with a kind of root Welsh lesson. So if if you if you if you study them hard, you you will be a root Welsh speaker yourself. Maybe this through this program will help expand the number of people who know bits of Welsh. Exactly. So this, obviously, this is such a Central and Eastern European story, and in some senses that fits the shifting borders and melding of cultures that are in those regions. But David Farkas is asking what the geographic limit is of people who spoke Broad Welsh. And Susan Zuccotti asked a similar question, which is, was there a equivalent that's popped up in Western European countries um, that grew from like French uh, or Dutch and not from German? Yeah, I mean, this is this was for me one of the interesting discoveries that you know I because I had this long-standing connection to it, I always thought of it as something very particular and very unique, and in many ways it is, especially this combination of German and Yiddish and 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 the whole history we've been talking about. But as I was studying it and thinking about what kind of language is it, what the, the way it sort of captures a community that, that, that shares a particular lifestyle and so on and so forth. And looking around, I realized that it, in a way it's almost universal in that whenever you have a very distinct subgroup within a society, something like a Rotwelsch emerges. And so I, so there absolutely, there's a, the, you know, the, the, the way in which we sometimes call a, a, a cant or, or these kinds of jargons, it, the word jargon, it's connected to jargon, uh, uh, the French word jargon or argot. Uh, there's in London, uh, it, the Cockney rhyming slang was sort of a somewhat secret uh, language. There's in, 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 in Iran, there's a language, there was a language called Lotterai, which was Mostly spoken by uh, Jewish merchants, uh, that also be was sort of was sort of a professional language that was incomprehensible to outsiders. What did you call it in, in Iran? Excuse me. What was the name of the, this language in Iran you're referring? Um, to? It, it, it's let me try to type it. It was it's called Loter lo, Loterai. Wow. The whole universe of languages that are that are it's it's new to me, and I imagine for a lot of our audience members as well. Uh, 
Barbara Kessel asked whether your book is available in German for German audiences. And, and because you, you speak both, how did you think about the decision of who, who your audience was gonna be when you sat down to write the book? You know, that was very complicated. So yes, it's being translated right now. Uh, and of course, I'm, I'm really uh, 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 glad uh, that it is. Um, as I said, in, in some ways, it, it, it is a book I felt like that it also tracks my move, my migration from Germany to the United States. So it, it's something that I, in some sense, uh, about my past and my country of my birth, I wanted to from, you know, from my American friends and, and, and readers to know about. Um, but uh, um, of course, it's also, uh, you know, I, it's in a way I'm working through and thinking about Germany. Uh, and so I'm, uh, uh, I'm glad uh, that it's being translated. You know, I, since I've lived in the States for 25 years and almost all my writing has always been in, in English. It seemed in some sense natural to write it in English. Uh, um, uh, but also I think a little bit because of that, that distance that I needed in order to really think about uh, this whole history. Uh, um, I think I was glad in many ways that I was uh, uh, you know, writing it in English. Although, you know, just actually uh, 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 earlier this week, I was talking for the first time to my German editor uh, uh, and we were thinking about what changes to make uh, uh, for the German audience. Uh, so yeah, it's, it, it, it was not an easy uh, decision, uh, especially since part of what I wanted to communicate is also how how alive and lively it is and how it still shaped our language. And that's, of course, to a much greater extent true of German, which has many more expressions like in a pickle or going to shul that, that somehow made it into English uh, or certain uh, jargons of English. Uh, um, so I, I, I think there will be maybe a little appendix that, that brings that out uh, uh, for German readers. Well. I I want to respect everyone's time. So unfortunately we need to wrap up in a moment, but I, a big thank you to, to Martin and to Marina for your time and for sharing some of your experiences and, and knowledge with us. This was fascinating. Uh, for we, everyone who's watching, we will send out a recording of today's program tomorrow and we'll put it up on the museum's blog. So feel free to share this with other, others if you found it interesting. Uh, we do have programs all the time, uh, everything is, virtual these days. You can tune in from anywhere. We're hosting next week on the anniversary of Kristallnacht, a wonderful Holocaust survivor named Ruth Zimbler from our Museum Speakers Bureau is sharing her story of surviving Kristallnacht as a child in, in Vienna. Uh, and then on Sunday, November 15th, we're hosting the Klezmer rock band Golem for a live concert which, with no audience, which we're then streaming out to, to, an audience, uh, to an audience at home. So you can find out about all these and support the museums work, which would be greatly appreciative of on our website, which I just put in the chat. Um, we will also include in the follow-up email tomorrow some other links and, and suggestions for further exploration if you're interested in this topic today. Any final thoughts, Martin and Marina? Well, I just want to thank everyone. Uh, I've been trying to read all the comments uh, uh, as we were speaking, and, and I probably wasn't able to see all of them. Uh, and just want to encourage people, if you if you have any follow-up questions, please don't hesitate to email me. If you just type in my name, my email will pop up uh, uh, and I, I'd love to hear from you. And just to, to thank you, Ari and, and Marina for, for having this conversation and everyone to, for tuning in. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm so grateful to the museum for having us again. And, and <laughs> thank you to everyone for, for tuning in. Absolutely. Well, we wish everyone here a safe and peaceful election week. And, uh, and we thank you for, for joining us today for this conversation. Take care. Bye.